Hey everybody, Alex the Critic here, and way back in July of 2022, I uploaded the 18th episode of Your Theme Song Sucks, which covered shows that had 3 second title cards. One of the cartoons that I went after in that episode was Magical Girl Friendship Squad. For those of you who haven't watched my video, or just plain forgot what was in it, Magical Girl Friendship Squad was an animated action comedy series produced by the Sci-Fi Channel. Created by Kelsey Stefanides, who designed the show as an homage slash parody of the Magical Girl subgenre of Japanese anime with a distinctly American bent, Magical Girl Friendship Squad, which I will henceforth be calling Friendship Squad just because it's less of a mouthful, consisted of a single six episode season that premiered on September 26th 2020. Some of you may be wondering why I'm bringing this show up. Is it because I've changed my mind about its theme song? Oh hell no! I still think that its theme song sucks. No, the reason why I'm talking about Friendship Squad again is because when the show actually premiered, it got torn apart by the majority of the internet for being what they saw as a soulless, pandering ripoff of other better shows as well as a cultural slap in the face to the very genre it was trying to parody. Now, I didn't watch any of these videos myself, but that was mostly because I didn't care enough about the show to hear what other people thought about it. However, ever since I covered Friendship Squad on Your Theme Song Sucks, I've been curious about the quality of the cartoon itself. Was Friendship Squad a misunderstood masterpiece? Or did its critics actually downplay how bad it was? Given that the show only consists of 6 11 minute episodes, and all of said episodes have been uploaded to YouTube for free, I decided to answer that question for myself by reviewing each and every one of them. Join me as we evaluate this infamous cartoon, starting with its pilot episode on this installment of Alex the Critic. Our story begins at a subway station, where a thief robs an innocent civilian of their wallet. Well, I'll give this show props for being realistic. Dude, you're blocking the stairs. Welcome to Brooklyn, buddy! Tourists. Did these two just shame a fat person for being fat? I like them already. As these two women leave the subway, the one on the left, named Daisy, starts complaining about how the other, named Alex, lost their job. Yes, I recognize how fucked it is that I share a name with one of these characters, and no, I will not appreciate any jokes that are made about that coincidence in the comments section of this video. What exactly Alex did at her job isn't explicitly told to us, but given how Daisy gushes about her food craze ideas, I'm guessing she was a journalist of some kind who specialized in the culinary arts. Anyways, Alex tells Daisy not to worry about it, because her job was soul crushing anyhow, which prompts this response. Now you can finally reject the outdated notion of job monogamy. Like for me, before that off-brand snack company fired me for tweeting that the green M&M could get it. Wow, I had no idea Linkara wrote for this show. They wouldn't let me do more than 20 hours a week on their social. Cause that's when they legally have to give you benefits? Yeah. Damn, that is some biting social commentary. This show is really making me question my entire worldview. So I just picked up extra work doing audio editing for that podcast where three white dudes review airport bathrooms. Until they also fired me for tweeting that Amelia Earhart could get it. 
okay, the joke worked the first time because I could genuinely see a corporate candy brand firing their social media manager for posting a disgusting tweet like this, but why would she get fired for doing the exact same thing when working for a podcast that's about such a niche topic? I don't even think what she tweeted was that offensive. Like, I see way weirder shit being posted by content creators themselves all the fucking time. Alex tells Daisy that she'd be fine having one job so that their landlord, Lulu, doesn't evict them. Oh, we'll get jobs. The next big thing is just around the corner. <gasps> get it? Daisy told Alex that the next big thing was just around the corner, and just then, the magical being who will bestow them superpowers materializes right behind the corner from them. Isn't that just insanely clever writing? Daisy and Alex then reenact scenes from the John Wick movies before arriving at their local cafe. Anyway, I don't even need a job in programming. Oh. Never mind. I guess Alex was a programmer, not a journalist. Just something simple that doesn't have an awful commute. Not to be that guy, but girl, you live in a big city. Your commute is never not going to be awful. You'll be lucky if someone doesn't attempt to rob you on your way to work. Something that's in the neighborhood. Come on. Wait until Alex finds out that the cafe isn't actually looking to hire anybody and the owners just left that sign up by the window by accident. Alex and Daisy, I've found my guardians. I'm convinced that these two should be my guardians because... That energy spike could only mean one thing. We've finally domesticated the electric eel. Creator has taken form in this world. And I should know because I'm... I'm sorry, who are you again? Uh, I wish my passion for spying on strangers from behind trash cans could pay the bills. Oh well, back to being a corporate attorney, I guess. Zavity and I'm gonna go rip people up. Thanks for that scene, writers. It really added a lot to the episode. I don't get it. What was the joke here? Is it that she already works at a job where she gets paid to spy on people? Was that comment about what her passion was supposed to be sarcastic? What was the damn punchline? Anyways, back at the cafe, Daisy tells Alex how she'd be able to get her free coffee if she works there, while Alex tells Daisy that working here would give her a chance to get closer to a patron of the cafe that she has a crush on, whom she calls Coffee Dude. What do you think he's always studying? Probably like how to be a artisanal beekeeper. Don't get your hopes up, Alex. Chances are that book is just a disguise, and the guy's actually just doing this. At last, they arrived at Narvok, where the temple was now consecrated to the cult of Siroth. Arriving at the snow-clad moor that sloped down to Felwyn's Gate, the company surveyed the grim scene before them. Snore, you literally only like him because he's a blank slate you can project your fantasies on. I know. Did... Did Alex just admit to being incredibly shallow? Points for honesty, I guess. But remember the time he smiled at me? <sighs> that was pointless. Hey, Michaela. Isn't it weird for you to come here all the time when you've, you know, ground beans with all the baristas? Why would Daisy having friends who enjoy cooking food with her make visiting this cafe weird, huh? You need to stop being so clingy, Alex. You're such a mom. It's whatever. Exactly, Daisy. Having platonic relationships isn't against the law. After Daisy and Alex grill each other about not knowing anybody else's name, they approach the barista at the counter about the cafe's job opening. I'm very qualified. I just left a job at a culinary experience formation startup, so I've worked with stuff just like CBD lattes. Okay, what job was Alex fired from? Was she an engineer? A programmer? A journalist? A food critic? A chef? 
What? You. No offense. <laughs> Do you have barista experience? Not specifically, but... Sorry, baristas have to be certified, and to get certification, you need at least three years of barista experience. Jesus, you gotta go through all that just to serve people shitty, overpriced drinks? I think I know now why our country is going downhill. But then how does anyone become a barista to begin with? Careful now, Alex. You're asking way too many questions. And you know what happens to people who ask way too many questions. No, no. One must be born a barista. Excuse me, miss, but I believe that exemption violates the Civil Rights Act. The creator is here on Earth in the form of some kind of small mammal. The energy levels around her are astronomical. Ah, did you have to lean into the camera when you were saying that line, dude? Do I have your permission to collect after she leaves the scene? I have an idea that should reap very powerful results. No, we must first wait until she picks two selfish, sardonic, immature assholes to be her guardians. Then we must wait until those guardians kill one of our agents. What? Ooh, vegan muffins. Ugh, this guy likes vegan muffins? Now I know he's a villain. Anyways, once whoever this guy is finishes up his conversation, we cut back to Alex and Daisy's apartment, where their landlord is waiting for them. Well, 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 the millennial freeloaders are to be. Might I ask where the rent is, or did you eat it with your avocado toast? You'll get your rent when you fix this damn door! Uh, the first isn't till tomorrow, right? Yeah, so you better hop off our dicks, Lulu! Whoa there, I think what Daisy means is we will definitely have the rent on time. We respect you. Aren't you guys glad to have such likable characters as our protagonists? I can just feel the warmth and kindness radiating from them. Lulu warns them that if they're late on rent again, they'll be evicted. Not wanting to deal with Lulu shouting anymore, Alex and Daisy run into their apartment, where they breathe a sigh of relief after slamming the front door behind them. Unfortunately, their brief respite from their problems is interrupted by a peculiar discovery. <clears throat> Daisy? Why is there a raccoon on our couch? What do you mean, why? You guys picked that animal up at the gas station last week. I am not a raccoon. I have taken the form of a red panda. My species is endangered, much like your world. Yes, rather than clearly explain who I am and what I'm doing here, I would much rather answer irrelevant questions that have nothing to do with anything and that will no doubt exacerbate the fear that you might feel from seeing a wild animal inside your apartment. I am a smart god. Alex? Yep, yep, I hear it. Talking raccoon on our couch. Yeah, I told them not to leave their window open. Alex, Daisy, I've come to you with an important mission. We must prevent the McRib from becoming a permanent menu item. Did you microdose me without telling me again? What's the phone number for animal control? Finally, some protagonists with common sense. Although, why they haven't tried to kill this thing yet is anyone's guess. Put your fingers inside me, and all shall be revealed. What? Ah, what's happening? The bird is sucking us in! Okay, why the hell did this magical being make her literal asshole the gateway to some alternate dimension where she can project images into the minds of our protagonists? Couldn't it have just used its mouth, or its nostrils, or the jewel on its forehead? I created this universe and everything in it. If that's the case, then who created you? It is one of many universes created by myself and other beings like me. But those other beings are totally fake and gay, so don't bother paying them any mind. But some beings are driven by destruction rather than creation. They seek to destroy this universe by using its own power against it. Hey, come on! Just because I'm an irreverent cartoon reviewer with ridiculously high standards doesn't mean I'm a harbinger for a dark god of deceit and domination that's hell-bent on destroying the entire world. Okay, Satan, I think we fooled them. 
Ah, hold on, the internet's out. Ah, yes. You can totally see how these women are deserving of this ultimate magic power by how Daisy cares more about her Wi-Fi being out than she does about the fate of all existence. And, uh, why does it matter that Daisy and Alex's Wi-Fi is out right now? Do the Magical Guardian's projections only work if she's connected to the internet? Oh, are you on the Alex and Daisy please stop stealing our Wi-Fi or we'll lock it network? You'll never believe this. They locked it. Okay, if Alex and Daisy's neighbors know that they've been stealing their Wi-Fi, then why did they bother politely warning them not to do so instead of just locking it in the first place? And once again, why do they need Wi-Fi right now? <clears throat> These evil forces have been amassing your universe's energy for some time, particularly from this planet, its largest source of life. How have they been amassing your universe's energy? What energy am I even talking about? And how does it work? I'll file those questions into the shit that'll never be explained in this episode folder. Try 3C's Wi-Fi. No, you fools! 3C's Wi-Fi will just upload malicious viruses into your phones once you connect to it! So I suppose you don't want to hear about the special powers I can grant you. You know, you probably should have led with that, Trash Panda. Powers? Fuck yeah! Oh, what kind of powers? Can we wish for a million dollars? Ha ha ha! Let's just blindly trust this mysterious talking animal that suddenly appeared on our doorstep, even though we have no way of knowing if they can even be trusted. Of all the qualities of heroism that these two women have, it's their intelligence that really speaks to me. No. Oh. What's your name, Creepy Panda? Case in point, it took them up to now to ask this creature what its name was. I have chosen the Earth name Isis, after the ancient Earth Goddess. Ooh, do not love that. Name's no good anymore. Okay, that was kind of funny. Fine, you may call me by my native name. XX Pussy Destroyer 69 XX. Nut, mother of Isis. No. Hmm. I prefer the name I gave her. Nope, no Isis. Forget about Isis. Don't run your one good joke into the ground, writers. Now, each of you must choose the object that will activate your powers. You must carry this object with you at all times. And if you could... Please don't choose anything stupid. Fine. I'll pick my birth control. It'll remind me to take it. Obviously choosing bong, sell it. Not practical. Are you sure it's not too late to pick different warriors, Miss Guardian Lady? You, Alex and Daisy, are my fated guardians. It is now your duty to protect the entire universe. And I've decided that you guys are perfectly fit for this role because the plot says I need to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You didn't say anything about duty. <laughs> duty. We can't protect the universe. We can barely take care of ourselves. I used a W2 as a pad last week. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I agree with these guys. What makes them suitable to be Earth's magical guardians? Keep in mind, we still know absolutely nothing about these guys at this point in the episode. All that we're told about them is that they're both unemployed and they both have active sex lives. What made the creator of this universe so certain that these guys deserve the honor of protecting the Earth from all magical threats when she's only known them for a grand total of three minutes? But you are warriors. You said you killed three men with a pencil. You know, this series actually makes a pretty compelling argument for the existence of the traditional Christian God, because the Christian God isn't so bottomlessly stupid as to think that his chosen prophets are good warriors just because they said they were. Also, talk about a happy fucking coincidence, huh? If Daisy and Alex had instead opted to reference some other movie in order to pretend to be showing off a more mundane skill, like cooking food, Nut probably would have mistaken them for chefs and searched for other people to be her guardians. But nope, they just happened to pretend that they were vicious killers by quoting John Wick at the exact same time that Nut materialized behind them. 
on that note, this makes Nut even more of a dumbass because even if she believes that Alex and Daisy are good warriors just because they said they were good warriors, that still doesn't tell her about whether or not they're good people. By her own admission, all she knows about them is that they can kill people with a pencil. She doesn't know if they're actually good, kind-hearted souls or anything. For all she knows, she could be giving her power away to megalomaniacal despots who will go on to destroy the earth that she's trying to protect. She doesn't know if that's the case, but rather than having them go through some sort of test of character that would confirm to her that they are indeed kind-hearted souls, she would rather just blindly trust them with her power. You know guys, I'm starting to think that maybe we should just let the universe be destroyed. It's clearly not worth saving if its inhabitants are this fucking stupid. Anyways, Alex wises up and asks two very legitimate and obvious questions. Why Nut doesn't get somebody else to do this, and why Nut doesn't just deal with these magical threats herself. Oh, and get ready folks, because if you thought that Nut's justification for giving Alex and Daisy these powers was stupid and forced, then get a load of her answers to Alex's questions. In your world, I am merely a helpless red panda with limited access to my own powers. This is your destiny and yours alone. And if you don't fulfill that destiny, then your universe and everything in it, everyone you have ever loved, will die. <laughs> First off, why can you only manifest as a red panda? Why specifically a red panda anyways? Does it have anything to do with the energy that's being absorbed by those evil creators you were griping about earlier? That would have been a nice bit of world building if that's the explanation that was given to us, but instead we get nothing. Second off, Destiny? What destiny? You just finished telling us that you only chose Daisy and Alex to be your avatars because they said that they could kill people. That's not destiny, that's just piss poor vetting. I would also like to remind you that neither Daisy nor Alex tried to clarify to Nut that they weren't being serious when they said that they could kill somebody with a pencil. Nor does Nut's explanation here actually answer Alex's question as to why she doesn't just get somebody else to do this shit. Me thinks somebody didn't give the script a once over before having the voice actors record their lines. Is that it? <laughs> Did you think that was news? <laughs> that shit's like definitely happening anyway. Does she not know about climate change? <sighs> you know what? Let's just call animal control from the coffee shop. Again, what about these two women screams hero to you? <sighs> I guess I cleaned my butthole for nothing. Well, look at it this way. I got nothing. Alex and Daisy walk into the cafe, only to be disturbed by the sight of its patrons being uncharacteristically relaxed. They try asking the barista what's going on, only for her to reveal herself to be a horrible monster. Bullshit. Wait, you got possessed by a disgusting monster after we were doing it yesterday, right? So, is this monster a shapeshifter that was impersonating a human being? Or is it a malevolent spirit that is possessing a human being and morphing them into a monster? Because Daisy seems to be under the impression that it's the latter. And that does not bode well for what she and Alex do at the end of this episode, but there I go getting ahead of myself again. They're just relaxed. I slipped them a little extra CBD in their lattes. Or <laughs> maybe a lot extra. Uh, are we sure this lady's a bad guy? Because Lord knows I could go for a joint right about now. Who needs all that pesky energy? Once I finish collecting their energy in this crystal, my boss will be one step further along in his sinister plan. 
so I noticed that you didn't actually answer what Daisy asked you, which was, are you or are you not a shapeshifter? I know the ambiguity behind what this monster is seems like a nitpick, but trust me, this issue actually hurts the episode a lot. You'll have to wait till the end of it to find out why though. And also... Why are you telling them all of this instead of just killing or incapacitating them? Why is she telling us this? I don't know. It seems really unnecessary. Pointing out your problems doesn't make them go away. You still need to explain why your villain is being so goddamn stupid or else we're gonna be taken out of the story. Say night night to your fellow freelancers. Because when this crystal leaves your universe, They'll die. I tried to tell you. When you said everyone would die, we didn't think you meant like real people. Like now. Who the hell did you think she was talking about, you fucking moron? Again, if this is how smart people are in this universe, then maybe nuking the whole thing isn't such a bad idea. I'm just saying. Can't you do something? Once again, it's Daisy's intelligence that really endears me to her character. It takes a special kind of genius to ask a question that they already have the answer to. To reiterate, I am a panda. Right. You're just a panda and can offer no help to our protagonists outside of bestowing them with these awesome powers that you have no way of knowing if they can even use properly. Say, what did the Nostalgia Critic have to say about all powerful magical guardians who don't bother to exercise basic common sense? You know, from my past experience, spirit has usually meant a coward chicken pansy who doesn't want to get hurt and would rather sacrifice the lives of teenagers so that she doesn't miss her favorite reruns of Gilligan. But hey, that's just my past experience. Yep, that fits not to a T. Or, I guess an N in this case. Oh boy, we're really doing this. You know what? That transformation sequence was actually pretty humorous. It's too bad that the animators had to ruin the joke by having Alex and Daisy dab at the end. Nope, no way, definitely not. We look like we're playing figure skaters in a porno. Who designed these? I thought they were quite stylish. I'm gonna just put on a jacket real quick. I'm kinda chilly too. Let's do this. Wait a minute, guys. I think we might actually have Friendship Squad all wrong. See, it's actually secretly based because it promotes modesty over degenerate displays of sexuality. Also, how nice of the villain to allow Alex and Daisy to change into said modest attire and ready themselves for battle before attacking them. If there's one thing that'll help you take over the universe quicker, it's being polite. Last but not least, for being the creator of all known existence, Nut sure is a perverted little panda, isn't she? This is the outfit that you're going to give your messiahs, and you actually think it looks stylish? Once again, this show is making a pretty compelling argument for the existence of the Christian God. barista experience. Man, it's so fortunate that Alex and Daisy are so good at using their newly acquired powers right off the bat, so much so that they're effortlessly beating the shit out of the very first villain they've met. That way, we don't have to make them go through any of that pesky training that other magical protagonists do. Why would anyone want to see them go through all of that anyways? Character development and story arcs are for faggots. Hey, would you watch my laptop for a second? Oh yeah, I got you. <laughs> no, that cost me $24.95! Ha <laughs> ha 
You know, CBD has been shown to do wonders for cellular regeneration. Uh, actually, the studies on that conflict quite a lot. Also, while the show did technically answer my question about what type of monster Daisy and Alex are fighting, by having it survive getting decapitated by a laptop that Daisy threw at it, that still doesn't make the issue of our hero's morality any better. Since up until now, Daisy thought that she was fighting a monster that had possessed a barista, aka a normal human being. Wait, you got possessed by a disgusting monster after we were doing it yesterday, right? And yet she saw no issue with decapitating it with a fucking laptop. Yeah, these two really seem like valiant defenders of the innocent, don't they? Your pathetic attempts won't stop me. Maybe not, but I do know one thing that can. Overall enthusiasm, overall enthusiasm, overall enthusiasm, yeah! Magical objects. We have to say what? Oh, fine. Long sell it. What? Fine. <laughs> Shit. What was my thing again? Birth control. Pubertize. Again, it's quite a good thing that the villain is polite enough to wait for Nut to finish telling Alex and Daisy how to activate their magical weapons. It really adds to the suspense of this fight scene. I think I just got my period. How does a magical monster know what a period is and what it feels like? Wow, that was surprisingly easy. Makes you wonder if they could have achieved this exact same result by just shooting the crystal with a gun. Well, maybe if you'd spent less time gawking at them, and more time attacking them while they were screwing around, you wouldn't have lost your stupid floating crystal, lady. Unsurprisingly, the weed monster attacks our duo, but is quickly put down after a couple mace swings to the face. I'm not gonna lie, the animation for this fight scene is actually pretty decent. Not amazing or anything, but far better than what I was expecting. It almost makes you forget how little sense it makes for Alex and Daisy to be so good with their powers, despite this being the very first time they've ever used them. Take my bra! What the hell? How did he just get the credit for that? Because this is what passes for hilarious satire in the writer's room of this show. Is this thing gonna... disappear? Corpse disposal is not included. Seriously? Uh... Why do either of you care about what happens to this monster's corpse? Just leave it for the authorities to deal with. We just chopped up a dead body. Don't think about it. Bury it deep inside. Or you could instead bring it to your apartment, chop it up, and then try to jam it down your fucking disposal system, the stench from which will no doubt make people curious as to what the hell you two are up to. And instead of having the characters process any of the horrors they've just committed, the writers instead play it off for a lame joke. Again, if these are the smartest and most capable warriors that Nut could find, maybe we should just let this entire universe get destroyed. Hey, Millennium! Oh, fuck! The rent! Uh, follow my lead. Do you have my rent yet? Or did you TikTok a picture of your rent and then Instagram it on Skype and then put it on Facebook in between Twitter and- We get it, writers! She's old and out of touch! Move on! Uh, about that. We were just sitting here, normally, on the couch, not doing anything and being totally normal, and our garbage disposal got all backed up. Yeah, obviously we can't pay rent until the plumbing issues are fixed. You understand. We'd hate to have to call 311 and report negligence. I swear to God, if I was your mother right now. Boom, baby, John Wick 3. Ah, uh, avoiding their responsibilities by inventing elaborate lies and extorting others. The true mark of any noble heroes. I can't wait to see more of these two. 
Also, are you serious? You mean to tell me that Lulu doesn't bother asking Alex and Daisy any prying questions, nor demand that she see the supposedly clogged disposal system? For fuck's sake, Alex was nervously sweating while giving her this explanation, and neither she nor Daisy bothered to actually address what specifically led to their disposal system getting clogged. I guess fictional characters are only as smart as the people writing them. Ugh, it smells in here. Like, those weird microwave vegan patties. If you would just try them once, you would know that they're actually delicious. Oh yeah! I wonder why it smells so bad in your apartment. It can't possibly have anything to do with the dead body that you're currently dismembering. That reminds me, I have a very specific bamboo-based diet I'll need you to procure. Wait, you still need to eat things in that form? Why? You're the creator of the universe! Just go back to your world and sustain yourself with universe juice or something. We saw you transform into your red panda disguise earlier in the episode without any hiccup, so it can't be that hard for you to do. Naturally, Daisy and Alex don't take kindly to Nut's request to freeload off of them and the episode ends on an argument between the three of them over how they're supposed to deal with said freeloading. So that was the first episode of Magical Girl Friendship Squad, and yeah, it was pretty bad. Now to be absolutely fair, this wasn't the worst thing I've ever seen. There are a couple of things to like about this pilot. Some of its animation, specifically from its fight scenes, was decent, and some of the character designs were visually appealing. I particularly got a kick out of the way Lulu's son is drawn. He makes me laugh every time I see him, which is what I'm sure the animators were intending. Speaking of the comedy, there were a couple jokes and visual gags that did get a chuckle out of me. Plus, the voice acting was… passable. It grated on me at times, especially some of the line deliveries from Daisy's voice actress, YouTube comedian Anna Akana, who seemed insistent on giving me a fucking headache, but everyone did as good a job as you could expect given the material they had to work with. However, the scant praise I can offer this show pales in comparison to the literal mountain of issues it suffers from, most of which come from its story. Regardless of which show we're talking about, a good pilot needs to properly establish three things. The characters, the premise, and the setting. We need to leave the first episode with a solid grasp on who the characters are, what those characters are trying to accomplish, and what kind of place the characters inhabit. Unfortunately, Friendship Squad bungles all three of those things. Take a second to really think about what we were told about our protagonists. What exactly do Alex and Daisy want? What are they passionate about? What even separates them as characters? They share the exact same type of personality and sense of humor, they seem to take their guardianship pretty well considering that it uproots their lives and comes right out of nowhere, and they share the exact same dynamic with the deity that gave them their powers. Really, the only way to tell them apart is that they have different voices and that one is tall and Asian while the other is short and black, which is not a good thing. Worse still, they act more like villains than heroes, with the duo having no issue decapitating what they assumed was an innocent woman, and then chopping her corpse into mincemeat. Then you've got Nut herself, who's another character we're told next to nothing about, and what little we are told either makes no sense is a cheap cop-out to hand-wave legitimate plot holes, or makes her seem like a complete and total dumbass. All of these things combine to make these three thoroughly unlikable characters whom I'm not really interested in seeing more of. It doesn't help that the setting of this show is so bland and uninspired. Friendship Squad of course takes place in a New York-type city, 
but nothing about it stands out. You could swap this fictional city with any other cartoon's fictional city and it would look the exact same. That leads me to my overall thought about this pilot, which is this. Why would I continue to watch this Magical Girl show if there are a bajillion other Magical Girl shows out there that probably do what this one's trying to do much better? Of course, I will continue to watch it because my morbid curiosity compels me to, but that doesn't mean I would recommend you guys do the same. Then again, who knows? Maybe the show actually gets better as its lone season progresses. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Until then, I'm Alex the Critic, and I'll see you guys next time.